Okay, welcome. Uh, I'm Stan Allen, Dean of the School of Architecture, um, and I'm not surprised to see a very full house uh, tonight, but it's uh, gratifying. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone. So, um, so where, where to begin? Um, Rafael Moneo is, of course, one of the most significant architects and thinkers uh, working in our uh, field today. Um, but for me, he's also a mentor uh, and a friend. Um, so I don't need to mention the Pritzker Prize from 1996 and the many other honors and, and, and awards. Um, it seems um, somehow more personal, if you will um, indulge me with, with a little bit of, uh, of uh, personal history uh, as a way of sort of setting the stage for what Raphael has to say uh, tonight. Um, I first met Rafael Moneo in the late 1970s at the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies in New York, a place where so many uh, important figures from that time uh, spent, uh, spent time and passed through. Um, and of course, uh, Rafael uh, later taught here at Princeton in the early 1980s, I believe, brought here by uh, Dean Bob Geddes. Um, around that time, I think it was Kenneth Frampton who referred to Rafael Moneo as a kind of Latin intellectual. Uh, that is to say, we were aware of his writings, in particular, uh, the piece on Aldo Rossi in Oppositions uh, 5. Um, and people in New York saw him through that context, his association with the Institute and his association with uh, oppositions. Of course, not many people also at that time were aware of the Spanish context either. And uh, I, I could say, in retrospect, it's almost impossible to understand uh, Monel's work outside of that Spanish uh, contact. Uh, so, context. So a few years later, I, I contacted him. I wrote a letter. People wrote letters in those days. Um, and asked him about the possibility of working in his office in uh, Madrid. Uh, after a rather long interval, about six months, I think, I'd completely given up on the idea of hearing back from him, I did get a letter uh, that said, come at once, um, <laughs> uh, which I did, actually. Um, and I arrived in the midst of the competition for the Atocha station. Um, I guess that might have been why he finally called me. Um, uh, and immediately in that Madrid context, I understood a, a completely different side of, of uh, Rafael Moneo. Someone who was and is an architect, first of all, uh, somebody deeply engaged in practice and in building. Uh, someone who would sit down at the drawing board next to you and uh, block out a perspective. Uh, someone with major projects under construction, but someone who still ran a, a rather small atelier-like uh, office. Um, I consider myself very fortunate to have worked on the tail end of the museum in uh, Merida, uh, which along with Bank Inter and the Town Hall in Logroño, I believe have to be considered as some of the canonical works of those uh, early years. But there's another, and I think maybe more important uh, lesson uh, to come out of that period, which is the impossibility of disentangling his creative work uh, as an architect from his thinking and writing about architecture. So in other words, those sort of two sides, that sort of New York Latin intellectual and the Spanish architect are really one and the same. Um, everything that he writes about architecture is grounded in his experience as an architect, uh, but also you would say the totality of his work, writings and buildings, uh, suggests that all of this is part of what it means to be an architect. That is to say, both the interventions in the fabric of the world, buildings constructed in a very specific uh, time and place, uh, as well as the operation of reflecting in a more general way on the discipline and then passing that knowledge uh, on to the next generation of architects uh, reflect his faith in architecture as a discipline that is something bigger than any individual architect. And it was indeed this uh, complete identity that led to his invitation to become chair of architecture at Harvard's Graduate School of Design where he continues to teach uh, to a distinguished and ongoing career as an architect working in Europe and in the United States, uh, and to two uh, important books published in recent years. The book of essays, uh, Theoretical Anxiety and Design Strategies, which in fact takes as its subject precisely this tension uh, between critical work and creative work, and the recently published, and I think masterful is probably the correct word, uh, the book uh, Remarks on 22 Works. Uh, a book that also brings together 
uh, written reflections uh, with documentations of buildings from uh, throughout his career. Um, and in, indeed, I think this very same spirit will, will animate his uh, lecture uh, tonight. But before passing the floor over to Raphael, um, because this is our endowed Kastler lecture, I, I need to read a short statement um, in uh, honor of the donor. Uh, each year, we invite an architect of the highest international distinction to deliver our most prestigious lecture, the Kenneth Kastler Lecture. The series was endowed in honor of Kenneth Kastler after his death in 1964. Kastler was a member of the Cla Princeton class of 1927 and received his MFA here in 1930. He was an instructor in the school from 1930 to 1933 and then assisted on urban housing and suburban resettlement studies before starting his private practice in 1935. His dedication to the community was manifested by his service to many local, state, and national organizations in the civic, educational, and architectural fields as a trustee and board member. He continues his association with the school in later years by serving as a critic of graduate design in three different periods, as well as serving as chairman of the school's uh, advisory council. The first Kenneth Kastler lecture uh, was given in 1966 by uh, Buckminster Fuller. Subsequent lectures uh, have been by both architecture, architects and historians, historians such as Vincent Scully, Kurt Foster, and Rainer Banham, architects such as Peter Eisenman, John Haydick, Kazuo Sejima, Harry Cobb, Stephen Hall, Rem Kohlhaus, Paolo Mendes de Rocha, and Toyo Ito, among others. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome Rafael Moneo into this distinguished company. After the, such a touching and warm and friendly presentation as uh, Dean Stanley Allen has uh, made of my person, needless to say that I, am, I feel a bit intimidated <laughs> by just uh, being honored with the, delivering the Castle Lecture. And uh, uh, probably it, it, it will not be, or we will not have the depth of some of those uh, uh, critics that uh, have preceded me. And I wonder whether I will reach to, to share with those professionals just uh, offering to you what we do as an architect. I. Crossing and entering the school obviously brings me back into the days when I taught here, and I taught here in 1982, in the spring of 1982, under Bob Geddes and with Professor Balion Rat, and uh, then later I am so pleased seeing here somebody like Dean Stanley Allen, that uh, for so many means is too close to my heart. And uh, I am also just uh, have the, the, the duty to, to present myself also as an architect because I am now, I have the fortune of building a new lab for neuroscience and psychology here in, in this campus. And uh, I thought that, that perhaps uh, to make some reflections on my own work uh, will make sense instead of falling in a more academic dissertation. I, I think that I have clear what I would like to say. I, I wonder whether I will be able to do so throughout this presentation. But I have written just, just uh, a page for, for making clear at least uh, the goals before being lost in, in talking about the work itself. Some time ago, I was in a symposium at Yale honoring Robert Venturi. And reading once more complexity and contradiction, I found a statement that impressed me and that I will use as a theme for my presentation today. Venturi tell us that Louis Kant said, design is to adjust to the circumstances. 
This quote, so clear and direct, is also a surprising one, since Kant, who was so dedicated to discovering archetypes, insists that it, it is circumstances which contaminate design and allow it to reach its full value, just at the moment when they become architecture. For many of us who understand architecture as a discipline which provide, provides knowledge needed for building, and therefore design as the process that establishes the character of the buildings, Kant's insisting on the fact that architecture becomes real when it establishes its singularity, when it reacts to a specific condition, has a very special value. Such a vision, obviously, is in contrast with today's belief that the architect's freedom of expression is the architectural object. The provocative and overwhelming new means of representation in the hands of the architect have translated the design protagonism to the process instead, to the object, instead of the object. And in so doing, this process leads to an outcome that ignores the circumstances pertinent to the buildings as if true reality didn't exist. My experience with the projects I will present today is the contrary. My latest uh, three American buildings. On the one hand, all of them have been developed for American campuses of quite different character. An open campus in continuous evolution, Harvard, an Agora campus following the Jeffersonian tradition in Virginia, Columbia, and a campus embedded in the city, such as Rhode Island School of Design. A strongly diverging circumstances which each back questions squarely in the architect's domain. We will see three institutions asking the architect for solutions that serve both the design of, of, of the design of the new buildings as well as for the campus as a whole. What unifies these three projects is the degree of difficulty in the challenge at hand. Those responsible at the institution, at least I would like to believe, are conscious of these difficulties and consider that they require a solution born of the careful application of the discipline of architecture rather than the an encumbered freedom of personal expression. It is with such an assumption that I offer you today's presentation. Then the, 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 the title of the lecture, How the, 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 the Obstacles Benefit the Architect's World. In a way, I, I would say that uh, the more you, you understand where the, the true architectural problem is, is on, the, 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 the better, in the be in better condition you will be to afford the, the architectural design. And that is what I would like you to show in these three projects that are unified by being, they'll uh, say, uh, by implying difficulties, but very uh, characteristic size, and instead the, the problems they imply were uh, completely different. And then I will start without any more introduction. <coughs> the very first one is, uh, is uh, at Harvard, and is this, <coughs> Harvard is this, uh, is a campus just reviewing the, this afternoon the, the images I thought that to which genre of campus Harvard belongs. It isn't like, like Princeton, even though it has uh, this uh, presence of the city. Uh, Cambridge is not Princeton and Nassau Street, and, and yet it has something like that. It is uh, growing by independent uh, pieces, and yet it hasn't this, uh, let's say, autonomy that, that very often buildings have in, in Princeton. Buildings in Harvard, or at least I like to, to interpret in such a way, do the, the, this beautiful thing that um, having a double phase, that they are solving some, let's say, specific space, and yet are opening the game to something else. The clearest example could be said to be a building like that, uh, one of the buildings <laughs> that everybody likes better because probably is the jewel of the campus, that is the Sever Hall. 
the silver hall is just enclosing, and it did also when it was built, something like a courtyard. But beside that, it is opening the gate for the next, the, the next uh, courtyard with the, uh, Robinson and the, the philosophy department and the fog at the end. And every building can be said that makes and shares into this game. Even the building like the third science center in Tudor that was the result of a rather strong urban design operation was just facing out of the yard, the extension of the campus, and yet opening the game for all the things that were going to happen into the north uh, part of, of, of the, the north section of, of the, the sector of, the, of the, the campus that is the science center, the science campus. Here we are, <coughs> the, the, the an image is showing you where was, uh, we, were, we needed to do something into there, to keep in mind that. And then, I, for me, it's very, uh, let's say, touching an image like that because it shows the, the true essence of, of Harvard. Harvard isn't this landscape-like uh, uh, campus that is Princeton. Instead, it's this enclosed campus where the crossroads of, of paths are allowing to see people just looking for their fate and, and looking for what the, the, they are asking for each one of those buildings. And I like to see the campus mostly as just people moving. Are those people moving from one side to the other? What characterizes the, the, the essence of a campus that the, indeed leaves the building floating without defining any kind of space? Uh, difficult to say that the, the, the yard itself uh, has some attempt of, of making some uh, the outdoor space with the meaning in itself. It was much more the result of just building inside the present and only that, no doubt, but with some sense of producing all those courtyards and this double face in the buildings that I talk about. And then the, the, the issue was to build up the most updated uh, new uh, lab for, for the campus, what is called clean room. And those clean room ought to be built with the extreme safety condition, without vibrations, without dust, without magnetic fields, uh, with the ability to loading and unloading goods, and, and with the exhaustion of gases and is indeed something truly complicated. It would be to fall into anecdotal, and yet probably it makes sense speaking in a uh, in a place like Princeton. It would make sense to remind you that uh, scientists were reluctant to go away. Uh, Harvard was planning a new campus in Alston, and, and yet. The physics, the physicists, and the people working in the chemistry department and biologists, everybody wanted to remain on the campus itself. That could have been a great opportunity for just going five miles away for, from the campus and then the, starting the new campus somewhere else. And yet, uh, as people living in, in cities, people like to be close to the others. And the, the departments indeed were reluctant to quit and to go somewhere else. Therefore, we were asked when we started to think about that, where we could do this clean room that roughly should be the rectangle of, uh, let's say, uh, 100 by 200 feet, a rather large uh, piece of, of, of space, where you could do that in the in all this area that is the, 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 the science uh, north of, of the campus, that uh, being the, the science center by CERT, and then, then mm, that is Oxford Street, a street that, that was uh, changed in this uh, remodeling that was 
done by by CERT in the 60s. And, and then after thinking where we could, here is the Peabody, here is the, the physics department, trying to take out the, the, the space there was very problematic. We will enter in conflict with the city, with the city of Cambridge, and, and therefore whatever we did on Oxford Street, if possible, should be skewed. And, and then I decided, or oh, I uh, suggested that we could perhaps use the, the, the courtyard behind the science center to accommodate the clean room, and then that will mean to, to, to enhance and to revamp this uh, 50s building that is the McKay lab, and, and then but uh, and then that will mean also to improve the condition of this loading and unloading space. If we did that, then uh, that, that means uh, to build almost in an impossible side. Uh, I would like you to keep in mind these two images because it can be said that the entire project is in very synthetic way represented there. We, because what we did was adding something to this building in such a way that uh, difficult to say that that is an addition is something that uh, enhances and um, let's say uh, improves the the, the very uh, impoverished, impoverished condition in which the building was and added something in this void that uh, would allow to, to follow, uh, the, the, to, to stretch on the connections with the other labs and so enclosing something there. If, uh, here is the, the, the actual thing. You should imagine that the, the clean room has been put down here in the, in the basement and then that, that, that means, uh, let's say, uh, to attempt architecture as a discipline to find out which uh, devices, how would be the way of, of making this uh, uh, basement, this underneath the space, habitable? What, how would be the way of just helping the other old existing building of Mackay that, as I said, is unpretentious, that is very valuable building, a building that indeed the physics uh, estimated so much. And then you, you understand now how much was a cautious and, and yet probably wise choice to have the clean room here <coughs> instead of taking out some trees and providing access there. The access was going to happen into there. And then the, the, the building connected with this passes through makes uh, something that I indeed I, I start to be very, very interested on, and is the, the fact that buildings, they don't work uh, anymore. It's very difficult to think or to see buildings as uh, autonomous objects, as, as pieces that have a meaning in themselves. In a way, buildings are always uh, just uh, in company of many others, and you should think about that the buildings are not just uh, completing or making something contextual, but much more transforming context. In a way, uh, this building is not just, uh, uh, let's say, ending some uh, very well-defined architectural scene. Instead, it is uh, much more broadening and, and opening by its presence what uh, was going to happen with many other buildings. And then uh, the, the, the plant here shows you the, the way it works. I will consider very important in, in architectural terms, and that seems to me very architectural operations, the fact that by opening this moat, we are invigorating and making the two bays of uh, uh, Mackay active, even more because that uh, has, been, uh, has been excavated the clean room being below that with the using one existing loading dock. And then later, the other building is, a, in a way, uh, in this attempt to, to keep the building just uh, 
unencumbering and, and maintaining those uh, paths and, and making this double face that the building is attached to McKay, providing the face here and then um, becoming something as a gate for the north uh, for the north part of the campus here. This model shows very clearly what the, the, the let's say the architectural intervention is about. In a way, we are adding all that and putting this the tower above these uh, hollow uh, solids. Those hollow solids that are both keeping the, the building above uh, and, and as well as entering light to a, a basement that, that very much wants to, to be in contact with the uh, outdoors uh, life. And then <coughs> you see here the same thing as a drawing. Uh, the, the clean room is just all this space that you are seeing there. And uh, obviously uh, also below that, this is a building let's say it's something like uh, 220 square feet. It's a rather large building. And yet, even in this case, we didn't try to give the access to the building from our own building. The, the, it is the, the way in which we improve this, uh, the conditions of the other one after eroding, uh, turning down, and then rebuilding all what was happening in this corner. Now we are seeing the floor above, and here we are seeing one of the typical labs uh, somehow, and how it connects with the other, and how it connects also with the bridge. Here we are seeing the, the, the model, how these uh, hybrid conditions that I was talking about are uh, clearly manifested, and then now the, the, the actual scene, the actual scene where, again, some something that I will call architectural problems, the, the, the problem of reducing the size of that, that, that comes just embedding these gray surfaces into there and keeping the more blur ending that mixes with the sky. And then we are going from uh, Oxford Street into the campus. This is uh, a gate uh, condition that I was talking about that is so clear there, and then again, and then we are seeing that from the Oxford Street, and here now from the campus, and here the, the section, the section that shows this uh, uh, double uh, floor of uh, clean room, one uh, for all <coughs> those uh, uh, screening machines, and then later the lab. Uh, and, and then later the earth about uh, the, the, the hollows capturing and entering sunlight into the other level. We are seeing that from the campus in this moment. And again, the section in the other side, uh, you see the, the actual quite uh, imposing mass with the, these uh, very heavy foundations. The moat that allows to enter light into the corridor that allows students to see what is going to happen in the clean room. The clean room that exhausts all the gases through here and go up in, into there, and that is served by this uh, corridor behind, and is this uh, com inverted comb like relationship. <coughs> and then the, the, the moat. And the, the clean room, uh, the clean room plant, and the, the connection with the, the connection with the, the tower above, the, this tower above that above that is still allows to enter the sunlight into there, and then the moat, and then the corridor, and then we are seeing from Oxford Street toward the campus, showing this uh, gate condition that I was talking about, and I'm trying to to maintain and, and, and to keep something as, uh, let's say, steep facade into there, emphasized by the fact that the, the tower is uh, slightly uh, distorted. And then those, uh, uh, well, the, the, the big solids, hollow it, are they just uh, uh, holding darks as well as entering light and providing 
access for, for <laughs> stairs and so on. The, the cafeteria that, that happens in the in the uh, in the ground level, just facing south into the courtyard, cafeteria there, and those pieces that it can be said that synthesize uh, architecturally speaking, it can be said that the figural experience of the building is very much in the ground floor, in this uh, ground floor that has something sculptured like and yet uh, helping to, to, to keep going the people in the campus in a way that the, well, the, the, the building doesn't have any other rhetorical uh, feature but, but by that, that the, as I said, gives the, 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 to the building this sense of filter helping you to go and to move into the other direction. And uh, I think that that uh, is it. I ought to say that I am, I was uh, very, very much held by architect Valeria Mazarakis, who assisted to me in uh, working out the, the direction and the design in the uh, Harvard project. Now, we are in Rhode Island School of Design, an old image of Providence. One uh, quite quite uh, industrial city, so much change in the last 50 years. Uh, you will see this building to turn down, and uh, many other things still disappear. Here, still an old one. That is where we are going to act. Uh, still, this building was alive, and then here, uh, I, you ought to keep in mind for those of you that don't know. Rhode Island above, it happens to be, just summarizing, it happens to be brown uh, campus, and below in the main street, and spotted and uh, spread out in many different buildings, all the, the, the dif different departments and faculties of the Rhode Island School of Design of RISD. That uh, is, <coughs> then, it's a city that is very much uh, like that, but I wouldn't like to be distracted in this moment because of that. That is an eye view. This eye view that shows the, the channel that ends up in the ocean <clears throat> and the site, the new site, and what remains of an unfinished church that was uh, transformed in uh, RISD Studios. And then <clears throat> if uh, uh, I wanted you to see the, the, the project of uh, Harvard, just uh, thinking in this idea that buildings are not alone and that, that buildings very often are this kind of, uh, let's say, compound that, that, that the end is, that doesn't allow you to establish where are the, the borders and allow to me enter this uh, notion of just making new context much more that ending whatever is seen. Things are not any um, ever finished somehow. Uh, the, here, I, I would like to present the, this project as uh, uh, quite the token of how, let's say, the contingent, the, the contingent is uh, indeed the, the driving the, the work of the architect. That is the thing, the way it was. Uh, it is this uh, old uh, the, the memorial hall that has this very, let's say, imposing and hard and, and tough uh, pediment that, that somehow reminds to me some uh, rosy drawings and all those interstitial spaces and the museum in this Georgian architecture that was built in the 30s in spite of the style, and then the, the, the plaza that was taken over by all that, and those the spaces between uh, between the existing buildings and memorial, the, this is the level of Main Street, that above is the level of benefit where you will find Brown, and all that was, was taken by all that. And then <clears throat> it can be said that this building, uh, talking about the, con the contingent and contingencies, it, it can be said that it was 
let's say, the, the respect and the, the attention to all those small calls uh, provided by the existing facts, architectural facts, what, what actually is uh, just diving the, the, the form it has taken. It isn't a building that is born from inside. It, it isn't a building that, uh, let's say, has its own core, but it is much more defined by what the, it, it happens or how you think about the, the outdoors space, this interstitial space, uh, let's say, enhanced and revamp it, uh, revamp it in such a way that gives you way to this stair that allows you to give up. And the, 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 the building that, the, in this case, uh, I, I like to see this building almost like a building that is dissolved in the existing fabric and yet makes this uh, completion and makes this completion, let's say, helping the, the, the life of this half block that have the different entrances, has entrance from this lower level, has an entrance from college street in some intermediate level, and then goes up into the, 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 the benefit street. And here are some images of the building. From and again, you, you start, when I was talking about Contingencies. Uh, no, no doubt that I, uh, I am talking about how this building relates with the other. How uh, is this pleasure in finding the right material for just uh, trying to, to prevent the, 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 the bulky, con bulky condition of that? How the, 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 the windows are just addressing some points of the city, and we will see later on how the let's say, whatever thing is happening in the building is happening just, uh, let's say, being sensitive to what it was happened there. Uh, now you are valuing or recognizing why I use uh, brick to, to remain with that and how the alignment of that was so important and how the, the, the building is framing and how the whiteness uh, condition of the, the early 20th century building is, uh, in a way, lifted and go up with the, the, the much the lighter um, lightness uh, uh, mass of, of the new building, and how sections are not uh, anymore, let's say, sections that are generating from the section the, the buildings, as, as happened or has happened so often in contemporary architecture, instead the, the, the section is just sewing this level, is stretching on and crossing into the other street, and therefore mm, I didn't have any doubt about where this level should be, and as well as I didn't when establishing this solid for connecting with the museum. As a matter of fact, one of the let's say, programmatic endeavors of a project like that was providing a new access to the museum, an access that uh, bring, brings uh, people from lower levels in go and go directly there. And then <clears throat> the same can be said about the plan. The, 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 the plan uh, keeps the, line, the alignment, but then later recognizes that you want to, to, to move the people go into this uh, interstitial space that has been clean and then the, 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 the plant is just uh, liberating the, the indoor the central space uh, just adjusting to all the, the, the other uh, the, the, the other uh, small events and no doubt that the small auditorium happens to be in the, the, the back, just uh, in this dead line. And from here, it's very unpretentious in terms of, uh, let's say, materials and details. It was uh, indeed an extremely cheap building, and the access uh, to the, the uh, uh, auditorium that comes from the lobby. And then here, this, this building starts uh, to reflect from the 
the lobby, very much this uh, twofold condition. By one hand, the building should be understood as a new door to, to the, the Rhode Island School of Design Museum, that is a very <coughs> valuable one, and then brings people directly up, or this so that, that brings a student into another temporary exhibition room for the students. We are now uh, are arriving by the, the, to the temporary exhibition room for the student that happens then here, and yet the, the other stair is going up in the upper level there. Here is the 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 the, uh, <coughs> the level, the students level. This level that I showed you in the section, and, and it happens here. This open and covered space, the building reaches till this point, but uh, allow the students to enter from here, and, and they are able to enter also from the main lobby and going up into this uh, student's uh, the temporary exhibition room. And, and then from here, you go up into this uh, covered space that, that is um, quite an effective meeting room for the students and, and the people. Then we are now in the, the, the upper floor with the, uh, the temporary exhibition room for the museum that, that happens to be this one that is uh, larger, as you see. This, uh, uh, let's say, mm, pressure in, in recognizing, as I said, the value of the perimeter. Indeed, the, the, the perimeter is uh, establishing what the, 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 the structure of the building for those uh, open exhi uh, exhibition spaces was. Obviously, with these uh, diagonal uh, stairs that, that allow to, uh, but that keeps uh, in touch with the uh, codes, but, but brings the people here, from here, this bridge, and then entering into this other museum. But uh, here we are in the uh, students' temporary room, and the, the section shows you very clearly what happens about the access there. This is the level of the student that I was mentioning, then the, the, the passage to the museum, and then everything happens here in such a way as I said, that whatever occasion for, for making some, uh, let's say, visual intervention is, is taken and is dictating what the, the, the museum wants to be. Now we are seen to uh, to Rhode Island the, the, those interstitial spaces that, as I said, had been so important as they were. In a way, this is a building that has been worked out from the, the perimeter, from, from outdoors, and uh, it can be said that has been more carefully modeled what happens in those interstitial spaces than anything else. Just uh, those kind of always attractive alleys. The, this the student's space that I was talking about, the, the passage to the museum. We are seeing the same from the other, the other side. Here is the connection with uh, College Street. And here the section again, the, 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 this section that is uh, paying uh, so careful so carefully respect to whatever thing happens around us. We are in the temporary exhibition room, and we are reaching now the upper levels. That is the, the, the covered piazza in the above level. This is uh, something related with the museum. It's a floor that is the, the, the graphic design and drawing and etching that are storage into there and that have rooms to be examined and some seminars and, and so on. But uh, it, it can be said who, which is, is giving form and shape to, to a corridor like that. I would say that is this, it isn't the, the corridor which is structured that, but is much more, as I said, this uh, <clears throat> ability to, to follow track to all those uh, contingencies that I was talking about. The windows are open again with the same, uh, with the same goal, just just providing contact with the city, and enhancing the, the value of some of those views. The floor above, where the the 
RISDE has this tradition of uh, just uh, teaching drawing very carefully and they very much value what they call the general studios that are the studios for drawing and they have almost the mandatory piece of the curriculum that was drawing an image of the city and that explains why this uh, drawing room is uh, uh, opening toward the city. Here, the people working in the in the seminars for graphic departments, and always this sense that is something that I very much like indeed. This sense that buildings allow you to feel where you are, that, that you are very much taken by the city where the building has been raised. In, in, in a way, to to give this building the sense of, of being in. Uh, Providence in Rhode Island was indeed something I very much pursued. We are seeing that from the other side of the channel. And now we are coming to, to the third one. We have seen what the, the way we reacted into this very embedded in the urban setting uh, building in, in such a way that at the end it has lost uh, whatever, uh, let's say, own iconic value to, to, to be taken and absorbed by, by the entire city of, of uh, Rhode Island for this uh, transition between Maine and uh, Maine and uh, Benefit Street. And we are now in, in Columbia, in New York, in this uh, building that is, is going to be in this corner there, the corner between, sorry, in this corner, <laughs> in this corner here, uh, that uh, was one of the latest uh, sites available in, in Colombia, and then it was indeed a very problematic site, and if uh, difficulties and let's say this. Uh, attempt to, to, to react to all of them, either in Harvard or, or in, in, in uh, RISD, that they are magnified in, in a project like this one. Those are drawings from McKinley and White. Here is our site that is there in the days when McKinley and White didn't foresee that, the, the, the way it ended up. Uh, Columbia ended up just creating this kind of base that uh, wasn't uh, in the very first uh, layout of the, of the project. I, I consider the, the Columbia, let's say, urban design the project uh, quite a masterpiece, the, the way it did it's embedded in the, in the city with, this, uh, with such a simple strategy as just saying, well, buildings that are facing the avenue, the Amsterdam Avenue, and Broadway, and, and then later able to, to be respectful and don't make, a, let's say, a, a very conspicuous event from the street, and yet later being able to open all those uh, very, uh, let's say, powerful um, spaces, this uh, agora like, uh, I wonder whether I exaggerated in saying that the Jeffersonian model was there, but uh, probably don't. This is a, an image that shows you what uh, was planned by McKean, Mead and White when they thought that uh, with just this uh, aula magna, with this big uh, classroom, they ended up what uh, was going to be the campus with this subsidy-like space. Instead, uh, very rapidly, yes, in the late 20s, they thought that, that something else ought to be done and put a series of buildings following the same uh, here. But that shows you the anomaly of that. In the scheme like that, you see Chandler, the, this building, this uh, echoing once more the absent like a space, and then a street that goes up and serves this uh, <coughs> big uh, auditorium, big uh, classroom, and, and then uh, later anything but just landscaping all around. When, when that uh, was built, then the, if you look at 
the building like that, uh, Chandler at the end is added the, the new building in a rather problematic form, but recognizing that they very much wanted, ended up building or and extending and uh, enlarging what has been planned at the beginning. Here we have the, the site into there. That is very plainly represented what uh, has been built. And now we are seeing here the building the way it was, the way it is, and here the, the, the way it was. Uh, in the 70s, late 60s, it was filled up. This uh, stretching on the, the base of the campus, and then the uh, gymnasium was built on that. Some other buildings happened to be during the 80s, this very <coughs> bulky, bulky Shapiro building, or this other building by Jurgola, that even though it's a very beautifully crafted building, I would say that I, I don't uh, believe saying something, uh, well, something too personal in saying that uh, it isn't so useful in terms of understanding the, the spaces of, of the campus itself. It, it indeed uh, ignores what could happen to be in those open spaces. And yet here, the, the, the plan of that from where we started, that is Pupin, and then Chandler, one biology and chemistry and physics, and, and then the, 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 the big uh, uh, gymnasium below. We needed to build up something about that. And, and that, with the good understanding that there is a different level between the Broadway and the 120 and the, the, the base, uh, the, the, the level of the campus of uh, so many as 30 feet. And that is the, we ought to do something about that. And that is the, the way it was with those uh, tennis courts above. And then the, the, that comes as a very <coughs> easy reminder that the, from the very beginning I thought that instead of just <coughs> looking for solving, that was explored, the site has been explored for many architects, among them the, the late uh, James Stirling, and then uh, Stirling tried to, to, to offer a rather uh, building, a very singular building, a building that uh, was has was explainable by itself. Instead, <coughs> instead, from the very beginning, I thought that that we should afford the completely different strategy than that. And I, I always thought that the, the way of, of acting here was more keeping as much as we could the, the, the same sizes and, and the same, let's say, the type of, of building that was offered by, by, by Kimbid and White in terms of volumetric condition, that by so doing we were going to, to maintain those open spaces that I consider to be the, 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 the key um, or one of the most valuable assets of the campus as a whole. The other thing that we should recognize is that uh, Columbia is planning <coughs> another extension of the campus here in Manhattanville. And therefore, it was quite crucial to find out this corner almost as a, a new gate for the campus. Uh, actually, if uh, one day it happens, a flood of, of people moving from one campus to the other, that uh, was going to be, because uh, it was capturing and taking people from the lowest level, it should happen there. Therefore, and that the, the thing it is, and some images now of the building, the way it looks like, just to familiarize you what we are going to explain just now from the campus, and then uh, what the building tries to do. The, the, the building, as I said, to keep the, the, uh, the McKinney and White dimensional order seemed to, to me to be crucial. And, and that uh, is, it will help to, to do something so important as it was in a building like that, the, the connection between Pupin and Chandler. Pupin and Chandler happened this way, and, and the building should bridge both 
and, and the building should indeed reinforce the, the, the value of the alignment of Broadway, so still offering some hope to, to what could happen to be in this uh, north, uh, north uh, plaza of the, of the campus. And, and then uh, to maintain the dimensional order uh, and just uh, keeping the, the same base that uh, they used there uh, seems, seems to me quite an important decision. And therefore we came out with a, a rather simple solid, even though I ought to tell you that only at first glance is a, a simple building. It isn't at all it's a simple building. It's a simple solid somehow, but uh, I, I would like to explain to you how to accept the, all the constraints and, and conditions ended up the, the providing the, the riches that I believe or I would like the, the, the building to have. The, this uh, scheme shows you the, the, the access to the, the gymnasium that has improved the, the present access that happens to be from the, the campus itself in a much more convoluted way and then, then later you go up into a small public space that wants to, to work as intermediate space between the campus and the city and then you go up with mechanical stairs into the level of the campus and then later are all those connections with Pupin and Chandler and a classroom and the, the library and so on. Because in a way, and here it shows the, the, the section, because we wanted to jump above all that existing, uh, existing building, uh, we needed to, to, jump, to jump above just uh, using both facades as uh, structural members. In a way, we understood, again, uh, needless to say that it could, every, everything could have been easier. Had the, the, the Columbia accepted to come with the column there and, and then, but uh, it was sacred the, the, to, to maintain the, the column uh, conditions of the gymnasium. And then we, do ha we have a structural members there and a structural member there. So doing, we are keeping this uh, free space for the, the library, the library that's stretched on in another reading room above. And then later we can, with the, the rather standard light spaces for the uh, spaces for the labs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then uh, half uh, eight. That then, because we are, uh, well, we are giving them a, a considerable height, allow us to enter this uh, double space that provides offices for both students, students and teachers, joined between this uh, boy like a space that creates this community of work together in each one of those labs that we will look at more carefully now. Here are the, the sections showing that and then the, the construction and then the, the model that starts uh, you to, to be familiarized with how the things happen. You enter from there, from below. The, the gymnasium comes from there to there that is the holding structure, this holding structure that uh, ought to, to be understood is uh, well complemented by the fact that we are hanging all what happens here uh, with uh, making a much more complex structural phenomenon and all the, the, the vertical communication that are going to happen into here because you can't go farther away from there. And here, the, the gymnasium, the, the level of the street. Then later on, there's a cafe that uh, wants or should be understood as this uh, connection between the, the, the city and the, the campus itself. You go up throughout the rather, uh, let's say, well, sophisticated mechanism. You go up into the library, and the library has above a reading room, and the labs uh, in themselves are from here above and the vertical 
uh, communications are always, uh, let's say, constrained by the by this wall. Here you are seeing that the, the, the actual thing for this entrance, that the building is overhanging, so uh, preventing of being of having the, the rather rhetorical gate instead as it has happened, is nothing new, but it, it happened that the building receives you and allows you to go from below. And then here the building, this is the level of access. Here, this uh, cafe-like space that you go up by the rather conventional stairs, and once you reach to this point, that there is the, the welcome point where uh, the university and, and the community meet, then the, you go up with the mechanical stair above and then to all those library and classroom and all done and then from here up above, uh, from here on, all the, 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 the labs that I had been talking about. Now, again, I like, architecturally speaking, I like to see this line in connection with this other line. In a way, it seems to me it's something, let's say, characterized this uh, simple McKinney and white blocks. It is this uh, sharpness of, of those corners that allow you to go up in the defining this uh, very simple structure that the, in the, this uh, interstitial condition between both buildings allow the people to go up into an outdoor stairs that connects 120 and the, the campus itself. And here we are in this section that shows what I indeed like the most. I mean, because uh, it's true that when the Ren Kuhl has is talking about in the Lillius New York about this uh, freedom in using the, the, the different floors of a building, he is more often, let's say, thinking in terms of uh, just function or uses. And instead, here, the, 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 this freedom is very much manifested as a result of accommodating both the, the the conditions of the site, those difficulties that I was talking about, and the, the, the programmatic <coughs> request as well. And I like the, the, to see the simplicity that the, the solid has broken by the complexity of this access. You enter here from below, you go up into this level, you will see this uh, very generous space for the cafe, and you go up into here, and you enter into the, the library, or you go up directly into the, the lobby and the, the elevators for the labs. The, the, there is a point where they are meeting people going into the campus, going into the labs, going into the library, going into the classroom that, that happens there. Then all the, the, this, uh, let's say, uh, ability of, of, the, of the volume for uh, receiving and, and accommodating such a the disparate uh, program Instead of just, let's say, the pieces of the program are thrown out, thrown out as uh, very often happens in, or has happened in the 19th uh, architecture, instead that coming back again into this uh, ability to both uh, give an answer in, in terms of urban design as we try to do as, as well as we are just accepting that we we are able to move with a certain freedom <coughs> in the providing and the giving answer to all the, the requests of the program. Here you see now the, the, the cafe, the cafe that happens, we, are, we get up into these stairs, walking into there, and that it happens, this cafe. We, not, we have been rewarded, to tell you the truth. The building has been open in December, and no doubt that the, the choice of a space like that uh, means uh, or meant uh, some risk because uh, we, we very much wanted the, the building to be considered this uh, new access uh, from the city uh, for the students into the campus, but should or shouldn't be received and perceived the, the, the way we thought. Actually, we have been quite 
so please, seeing that, that indeed you, you don't find any time, any table free, just uh, taken, the people has understood the, 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 the cafe is settled in the most simplest condition. As a matter of fact, still the furniture, the tables and the chairs, they are those that we have chosen, that, that provisory chairs and, and yet and provisory tables. Ours will be quite close to that, just so on the way. But uh, it has been indeed uh, taken over uh, by people and that uh, is, uh, I think that has to do with the fact that uh, what makes this site uh, quite attractive is the fact that you are, in my view, is the explanation that I am giving myself, is the fact that you are out of the campus, the campus is in this level, then you take a rest and you go out of the campus, and yet by being out of the campus, you are, you feel almost being in the city, and yet you aren't in the city either. You, you are protected, you are enjoying the, the views abroad, Broadway and so on. The same comments that I did about the, the longitudinal section could be done in this section here, where uh, you see there the, the outdoor stair that happens to be there, and then the, the, the stair that goes up to this level, and from there you enter into the classroom, and then there this uh, very, let's say, subtle relationship that provides, uh, well, from time to time you need, uh, you make some in coincidence, but there are many others that you need to be connected by ramps or whatever, but makes all those interstitial spaces quite attractive for producing meeting points between people people using the labs and people working in the other seminar. This is the, the, the space before, that is the way it looks like just now. And then the, the, the same with the library. The, the, the library, we went on with this uh, very simple furniture that tries to, to keep privacy as, as well as uh, well accommodating the largest number of people. And here, the, the level above, the, this level above that uh, enjoys another reading room and this uh, classroom and the connection with the pupil in there. In a way, I like to see the building very much as, let's say, as this, uh, let's say, uh, independent episode somehow. Independent episodes and yet, yet uh, engaged and, and uh, embedded in, in this uh, uh, solid that is uh, both answering to those structural requests as, as well as, as trying to, to provide the spices uh, that uh, were requested by the program. Again, another longitudinal section seen the, the, the throughout the stairs. That is the cafe. That is the classroom, that the library, that the reading room, and then later the, the, the stack uh, labs with this. This is the access from the, the to the to the elevators in, that stopped obviously in whatever plan and because from time to time that is a stretch on with the offices for the students. Then what you are see that is the the what the classroom. I don't need to say anything, but just and then just very rapidly something about the structure. We had a, the very. I, I like to speak very highly about him. Is Dan Brodkin, who works with the Arup office in New York, and, and then from the very beginning, not doubt that that we have to solve this problem here, and um, he came out, and, and we wanted also to to liberate the, the entrance in a way that was able to to produce all the spaces you have seen, and then he offered to us. Uh, let's say, uh, this uh, scheme, we, we didn't change any diagonal, as you can imagine, and that is the result of, of optimizing the very, very complex uh, structural phenomenon, and a structural phenomenon that, that works like that, just uh, the suspended the structure from above. This uh, the chevron that takes all the, the longitudinal uh, efforts, this other that take the uh, transversal effort, and then what uh, came out from there. And then 
this, uh, the process of optimization, and the, the beautiful construction, the, the, those the trusses were uh, built and accommodate on the site, and then moved this way, and once we have jumped into there, we were able to go above, and now the, 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 the actual thing with, with the grid, the grid that uh, is uh, interrupted by those uh, open spaces, the, 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 those that indeed has been freed, but by that, that, and that, and then in the top of the building. And obviously, uh, that is a uh, Jasper Jones for speaking about this. Now it comes also a clear architectural problem, how cladding and which uh, was the use we we wanted to do of uh, the, this, this cladding. At the, at the end, we decided to go after uh, several other alternatives. We went into those uh, aluminum panels that are somehow, let's say, replicating or just reflecting or just uh, making conspicuous the structure that, that was behind. We will talk uh, afterwards a bit about this issue of, of infilling as a general architectural problem. But then here you, you see the, the size of the panels. And it's a photograph of my daughter, Belen uh, Moneo, from the Moneo Block office in Madrid, uh, well, uh, who had uh, helped me substantially in the, this the, the design, and therefore I want to give them the, the, the very much due credits. Actually, uh, Jeffrey Brock, uh, Belen's Moneo husband, is also a student from Princeton. Just saying that on the way, enjoy anecdotal uh, anecdote information. Then, if I there to, to come with this uh, image about from Jasper Jones, it was because that at the end, um, the, the issue of just giving to the building the skin some visual interest ended up by, by valuing the texture, this texture that in the case of uh, Jasper Jones, it is both uh, color uh, and uh, geometry. In our case, it is going to be more uh, geometry and, and shadows, and uh, trying to, to 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 accept the, the, the more anomalies we could. Whatever <coughs> it has happened that the diagonal, diagonal exists, then we kept that blind. But whatever it was, an open uh, the ability to come with the uh, uh, ribbon window, able to to connect the people with the city, we we did that as well as when it was needed some ventilation, we, we did the, 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 the same way. And here, again, you have the, the connection between Chandler and the, the building, and this, uh, let's say, way of, of interfering, the, 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 the two grids uh, creating this kind of, of textures that uh, I was talking about. And again, the, those images were, visually speaking, and just in terms of what the ends up being the, the, the architectural substance, I would say that, that both the uh, presence of, of the structure as, as manifested in the corners and in the flat surfaces entered into contrast with the, those uh, uh, windows and activity behind, and the same, the, the, the way the building looks like in close view, now here we are seeing that from Broadway. It's a very changing building in terms of, of light the effects uh, quite uh, effectively at whatever hour of the day. The aluminum still has this, uh, let's say, ability to produce reflections that indeed does the, the richness of, of the structure quite lively. A lot of uh, carefully treated details with the, the help of uh, Hench, that is also uh, a professor or a engineer that is in relationship with Princeton, some views from Broadway, 
the top of the building is still to be assigned some juice to the top, probably something like a lunch. The connection from the campus, from the campus, still that the plaza ought to be worked out and should be liberated all what happens here in this interstitial space. And then the very short reflection, we are close to the end, uh, very close reflection about, in a way, this issue of uh, what, how to deal with in feeling, it could be say, said that, that this is a very general architectural problem. The very general architectural problem that, uh, let's say, if we are talking about cultures, it, it could be said that the culture of Gothicism was uh, responsible of just uh, uh, exploring what to deal when in feeling of a structure is uh, clearly separated in the mind of the designer. And then it has happened all over Europe, from the north to, to the south Europe, and even from America, and, and the, obviously in the Chicago School, and with me, and with me, and even nowadays when the structure is taken, or in, in the case of uh, Rain uh, Kulhas, in, in just even exploiting more forcefully, iconographically speaking, just uh, drawing, literally drawing on, on the thinner skin of the glass, uh, what uh, was, let's say, the, the engineer's work, almost as is he, he was using as the, the fin final makeup, the, 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 the engineer the sketches, and then that is uh, the, the different layers in the case of uh, REM uh, TV in China. And then our building that, in a way, is more, let's say, concerned with, with, with being consistent with the, what the, the, the structure is about. And, and the, this point of view, it can be said that is weird or taken by the attempt to be <laughs> consistent and, and to, to uh, take advantage of the, the richness of the mechanical phenomenon for, for just providing the, to this uh, simple solid this richness of view that uh, with the uh, carefully crafted in feeling and at the end makes the, 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 the building rather unable to be said that you are, let's say, or that, that, that you are falling in a monotonous building in a way it is completely different from that and even more when the, the, the building by the, the, the for sake of, of just choosing the aluminum as a closer material to the content of the building itself appears in the, the, the campus as a beacon of this uh, new Columbia that it will happen in the connection with Manhattan Bill. I do like the, 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 the title of the lecture to be understood. If that has happened, I would be extremely pleased. And with that, I think that I have finished. Thank you very much. Outside is quite picturesque. And then, secondly, how important is it for this difficulty to be legible on the outside? Well, uh, I would say that the, to have left the, the, the structure the way it was is affecting, let's say, the specificity, and the specificity that comes from this difficulty that I was talking about. This difficulty coming not out from some uh, design decision. 
for instance, to just the, the two facade castles holding the building to that, it has been added what will happen because the building wants to liberate the spaces in the head and that therefore providing the subsidies and so on. But that at the end ended up with a rather very, uh, un, uh, it's not unclear, but a very direct way of, of just, uh, let's say, describing the, the tensional phenomenon the, the way it was. <coughs> Our, uh, let's say, what we have changed is that only with that, you do it, and with this uh, added, uh, let's say, um, added goal <coughs> or added the interest provided by the texture, the, the texture of the panels, and at the end the entire things, uh, you can't say that, that this is a rather uh, a building that falls in repetition, and that uh, just, just the contract, it falls in this, uh, let's say, texture with the, the structure that no doubt, I, 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 or I would like to believe that, that the, the naturality with which it comes out is because you, you feel that something, in, let's say, in, in uh, matching the, the natural structural condition happen. Having said that, the, the second part of your question is that uh, I would say that under this point of view, I wouldn't like to fall in the venturialism. I, 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 I don't need so much to express the, let's say, the, the specific or the, the singular condition of each one of them. Let's say, I don't need the classroom to show like the classroom outdoors either. And, and, and it could be said that uh, I am obviously uh, acquainted with what Venturi said when establishing, establishing these differences between a building that works in terms of answering the question to the city as well as answering the question to the, the inner extent of the building itself. But uh, I, I don't feel myself just uh, offering outdoors. I like the unified, uh, the unified scheme, the, the unified <coughs> that is provided by the st structure, and that is what actually has been done, as well as uh, by uh, making the, the very first decision probably is just being attached to McKinley and White, uh, or what I understood as McKinley and White uh, urban design principles. The questions? Uh, it's the use of the diagonal niche. Uh, you were so careful to show the alignment in the horizontal level, in the section level, mm -hmm. especially in the Columbia building. But uh, is the, the use of the diagonal dress also tries to establish some kind of connection with the building around, or is it just a reference to mm -hmm. the, the building next to it? Or the, the no, I don't think that has uh, anything to do with the, the building around it. It comes out uh, directly from solving structurally, uh, let's say, what we were forced by, by the gymnasium and by the, well, everything is a bit more complicated because, uh, again, the, the, the solid isn't, it doesn't work the way McKinley and White buildings used, that was with the central corridor and then rooms in both sides. Ours has already established some distinction that based are going to be respectful to the lab dimensions and then later what the, the left over is uh, used for the, the class, for the offices. Uh, having said that, I, 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 I ought to say that uh, the, the, the structure uh, is in itself, let's say, what, what we are doing is, is taking advantage of it for, for producing something that visually has the, the, the diversity that doesn't prevent putting that in something such, such simple, as, as well as it is in this simple, in terms of volumes, in terms of massing. Uh, if I wanted to go ahead with, the, with massing, it can be said that we have enhanced and enlarged the, the height of the building 
as much as we could by for the double reason. One, it would be because uh, coming from below, coming from uh, Manhattanville, the, the, the building emerges as something a bit more powerful. So something that happens in the profile of Columbia with Chandler that goes up and then ours goes even uh, like a kind of a hole of, of, of a boat of a name. So and at this point of view, very, let's say, clearly is expressing the, the, the willingness of being considered as the, as pivotal corner there. But then later on, it is the, 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 the structure what has held us to, to escape of what could be considered um, only simple repetition, only simple pleasure in whatever geometrical pattern. So something that happened, for instance, in the Miss van der Rohe building for the, the arena, where the, 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 the diagonals had been ended up just, uh, let's say, uh, well, reinforcing the, the, the geometry that brings uh, all those triangles into the holding columns. I, I don't know whether I answered you, but <laughs> more questions? For the morning? Yeah. Do you buildings respond to the environmental constraints of the particular site as well as the, the fabric of the city? It seems, for example, the, the, the sunlight and wind conditions of the, of the site. Well, how is that reconciled? Well, in the case of our building, uh, as you know, we are living days when, uh, when accomplished uh, the very voluntarily adopted rules. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of, I would say that. Uh, this is a building that obviously is going to spend so much energy from just keeping the life of the building alive that uh, uh, difficult to say that savings in just being extremely protective in terms of, uh, let's say, isolation, for instance, uh, wouldn't, be, wouldn't be substantial, wouldn't be relevant. And yet, uh, we found out that the, the louvers and the diagonals were able to provide shadows such a way that uh, we made the numbers for accomplishing the isolation codes in the present days. But uh, it could have happened some, some way. Uh, question? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the Miss Van der Rohe building is a very important building.